Ian McCulloch and Pete Wiley, once inside the damp basement club, encountered a clique of glam bucks, among them Pete Burns and Jane Casey. Matthew Street is in quite a bad area for sewers, and every so often Eric's would flood, and you'd go downstairs and open the doors and there'd be water, you know, knee high, and there'd be rats swimming in it. There were rats everywhere. Sometimes they'd just crawl out over the bar. We weren't all dirty and grungy in ourselves. That came later with the mainstream punk movement. All of the sort of punks or muses that I knew, even if it was Wiley, were incredibly vain. I mean, I know for a fact he had skin-tinted clearasil in his shaving bag, you know, but it, it was an exciting club. It was filthy, it was disgusting, um, but it did have a great atmosphere. Eric's owner, Roger Eagle, easily persuaded Julian Cope and Pete Wiley to team up with the glamorous punk Pete Burns in a lineup called The Mystery Girls, who made it on stage once. Roger Eagle just decided that I should be in a group because, you know, I, I dressed up freaky. And he kind of put a group together, which included Julian Cope and Pete Wiley. I can't really remember who else, well, I can, but I'm not going to say. <laughs> and uh, I fronted it for one gig with Sham 69. And my life just completely changed. I got in free, got drinks free. Bairns was Bairns with his makeup and his hair. Cope was in an overcoat, probably playing his bass. Um, I had. My mum's white mac with plastic gold buttons, white blouse with kind of blue flowers, a nylon blouse, red satin keks and a toilet seat that I used to wear. We split up after that one gig because Pete Wiley wanted to wear a toilet seat on his head. OMD were up and running and left the Liverpool scene. Back at base and still looking for a successful beat combo was top dresser Pete Burns, whose next creation, Nightmares in Wax, this time made it onto vinyl. Nightmares and Wax came about as we knew that if we did a gig and um, I looked really outrageous, somebody had put us in the studio just so we had a record because everyone else did and I hadn't, so it was just a thing I want to do a record. I couldn't get Liverpool musicians to work with me because even down to the days the Mystery Girls, Julian Cope would say, Oh, I know, I've got a really good idea. You stand at the back with a blanket over your head and, you know, I'll stand at the front because they didn't want people to look at me. Um, so I used to get, like, bin men, literally, who could play a guitar, you know, to come play guitar for me. And if they were any good, like, people like Wiley would jump out of a bush and say, you were really great last night at Pickwick's. Um, don't be with that loser. Come and join my group, you know. And they would be interested because he got more coverage in Sounds and Enemy than I did because they were really up the bum as well, those papers. They just couldn't stand the fact I was so fucking glamorous. Oh, that's the way of Pete Burns' old accomplice, Pete Wiley, had formed a band called Wah Heat and received glowing press for his early indie singles. As Pete Wiley began a patchy chart career, his old adversary, Pete Burns, found himself dressed and nearly ready for pop success with his latest lineup, Dead or Alive. We came out of Liverpool and I don't know what happened, but because I suppose I was vaguely glamorous, I wasn't associated with the Liverpool scene anymore. I was a contender for the pop field and Going into mainstream success, as I say, after, after being in Liverpool and working on that indie scene was really horrific. When I finished making the album and we'd done our thing around Europe and we were number one in England. I left my flat one day to get a cab on a place called um, Princess Avenue. I lived off Princess Avenue and of course I felt like Mr. Silly pop star, you know, dark glasses and headscarf and stuff like that and all these schoolgirls came running towards me because they'd recognised me and then they started screaming, get out of the city, you filthy queer, you filthy puff and throwing things and kicking the cab and stuff like that. Schoolgirls? Yeah, schoolgirls. I expected to be like adored by them because it was a pop star but it was these schoolgirls and they were big fuckers you know they were really they were really like farm women even though they'd seen me on the street every day and laughed at me when i got success when they saw me on the street they hated me i was the stately homo the, you know the, the local freak 
But once I got success and they thought there might be money, it was a real risk. Although rarely seen in the UK music scene these days, it's nice to know that Beat Burns is, quite seriously, after all these years, big in Japan. People say to me, what are you doing now? And they expect me to say working for the council. You know, I've worked a lot in Japan. I've worked in America. I've had hit singles in America and Japan and stuff and Europe. And I, I work out there. It's been like one long night out, largely. It's like I went out sometime in 1977 and I haven't gone home yet. I don't know if there's been any successful groups out of Liverpool for a long time because I don't pay attention to the music press, but it was really one of the best things. I mean, you hear that song, New York, New York, if you can make it there, you'll make it anywhere. I mean, they should rewrite that for Liverpool.